Hello again to all our YouTube viewers and subscribers. We know many of you are new to us, so welcome to the channel. It's great to have you with us. We're glad you're coming along for another Top 20 list. The last one we did, nearly six months ago, covered cars of the 1950s. We got many views and comments and are very pleased with how popular it's been. Many of you sent in other suggestions, and many were excellent additions to the list. In the near future, we'll be doing a part two of the 50s decade, incorporating all the suggestions we were submitted to over and over again. In today's all new video, we're featuring cars and trucks of what is really our favorite era, the 1960s. However, just like the 50s, there are simply too many designs we're crazy about. So this first installment is for the 1960 to 64 models. The next edition will be the latter part of the swing in 60s, 1965 to 69. We know this list will immediately set off a great debate and we sincerely hope you'll offer up your favorites that we may have overlooked. We got so many comments about our 50s choices, so let's keep it going. As in the first video, these vehicles are listed in no particular order and are simply our opinions. This list should be taken as entertainment and perhaps educational. Be sure to watch the entire video to see if your favorite made the list. Many Ford Mustang fans will not be happy that we omitted the 64 and a half cars. That designation was coined by enthusiasts. As far as Ford, the US government, and every state's DMV was concerned, they were 1965 models. However, you can be sure that this first year pony car will be on our next list when we do the 1965 to 69 top 20 in the near future. Well, thanks for spending some time with us today and we're looking forward to hearing your comments and memories. Now, let's go for a ride. Number 20, 1960 to 64 Volkswagen Beetle. I don't believe a list of iconic and influential cars would be complete without the Beetle. Although these cars had been available for years in Europe and South America, it wasn't until Volkswagen established a dealer network in the US during the 1950s that they began selling at an incredible rate. Yes, the Beetle was part of a line of air-cooled vehicles that included the Carmen Ghia models and the various bus and pickup offerings. Later, even more body styles would become available, like the 411 and the Thing. All had air-cooled engines that are mounted in the rear of the car, and many parts interchanged between years and models. They were reliable and easy to maintain yourself. They got great fuel mileage, which was starting to influence American consumers in the late 50s, when every American manufacturer began building a compact car to capture a share of this new market segment. By the time production ended for the U.S. models in 1979, the iconic Beetle continued to be built in Mexico. On July 30, 2003, the last of 21 million plus Beetles left the factory. Affectionately called the bug, nearly everyone born more than 30 years ago certainly has a memory of a Beetle. Every time we see a first generation Beetle at a show, it always attracts a crowd and it brings a smile to everyone that sees it. My favorite is the sunroof model, followed closely by the convertible. I don't think the world will ever embrace a car and the culture it's created like the air-cooled Beetles. Number 19, 1963-64 Chevrolet Corvair. The Corvair series was well received by the auto buying public and it was even selected as the car of the year by Motor Trend magazine in 1960. Naturally, GM continued to improve upon this winning formula by adapting such innovations as full power accessories, air conditioning, and better performance, handling, and braking year after year. During the early 60s, Ralph Nader had not yet made it his life's work to destroy this car with his infamous book, Unsafe at Any Speed, so sales were exceptionally brisk. Once the book came out, Corvair sales did suffer. However, it was later learned that many of his accusations were simply not true. One of the greatest technical advances to these cars was the addition of a TRW-built turbocharger in 1962. All series of these cars, including the trucks and vans, could be ordered with this power plant. 
The reason we selected the 6364 model is because I really like the grill on both these years. What matters most is that either body style is a Corvair Monza Spider, meaning it's got an engine sporting a turbocharger and putting out 150 horses. That's plenty for this lightweight car to give anyone a very spirited driving experience. Best color? Well, many of you are probably thinking red, but I'd prefer mine in satin silver with a red interior. Man, it's fun to dream. Number 18, 1961-63 to 63 Rambler American. In 1963, the Rambler American's build quality and solid reputation were enough to inspire Motor Trend magazine to select the entire line as the car of the year that year. Since 1949, except for several years skipped intermittently, the magazine has presented the Car of the Year honors to a manufacturer on only seven previous occasions. Rambler had three distinct series in their lineup for 63, and this was the last year for the more traditional look the Ramblers were known for. By 1964, the cars had all received styling upgrades in hopes of continuing to sell in impressive numbers for this independent company. These cars were still selling well going into the mid-60s, but American Motors simply didn't have the money to continually restyle and revamp each model or to come up with some important mechanical innovations and safety items. Of all the 61 to 63 Rambler Americans, I really like them for all various reasons. But I love wagons, especially two-door models. So the two-door Rambler American wagon gets my vote. Do you agree? If not, which model do you like? Number 17, 1963-64 Buick Riviera. Buick had used the Riviera model name beginning in 1949 on various models and subseries of their offerings. It was never a standalone name during the time span before 1963. This new luxury Buick was designed specifically to compete against Ford's immensely successful Thunderbird. The T-Bird began a market segment which was then known as a personal luxury car starting in 1955. The Buick Riviera was the perfect candidate to represent General Motors in this new category. Its distinctive body shell was unique to the mark and not used as a basic design for any other division. This was very unusual for a GM product. The rest of the design remained true to how it was first penned by the new GM styling president, Bill Mitchell and his team. As General Motors' first entry into the personal luxury car market segment, the Riviera was praised by automotive journalists during its high-profile debut. It was to be a ground-up design on a new GM e-platform debuting for the 1963 model year, and it was also Buick's first unique unto-its-own Riviera model. Yes, this automobile had it all. Looks, performance, comfort, and handling, and also the most distinguishable profile of any new car in 1963 seen on America's roads. Under the hood, Buick's 325 horsepower 401 cubic inch nail head V8 was initially the only available engine. Base price was $4,333, but often approached the $5,000 mark when popular options were ordered. In December of 1962, Buick announced an optional 340 horse 425 cubic inch engine, which would be available to order. Total production was deliberately limited to 40,000 units to emphasize the Riviera's exclusivity and to increase demand. By year's end, all cars had been built to reach the intended number. Incidentally, only 2,601 cars were delivered with the larger engine. Minimal trim and mechanical changes were made for 1964, with the most identifiable distinguishing features being a raised, stylized R hood emblem and R emblems replacing the Buick crests in the taillight lenses. The twin turbine transmission was replaced by an all-new three-speed automatic. In my opinion, these two years of the RIV are one of the most elegantly styled cars of the 20th century. The first generation Riviera is considered a styling landmark and has become a bona fide collectible car. They're breathtaking and perfect from any angle. I'd take either a 63 or a 64 model. Any color, but black with a black interior is timeless. It really brings out all the wonderful angles of sheet metal and trim. Number 16, 1964 Plymouth Sport Fury Hardtop. The styling on the 64 Plymouth Fury was dramatically different from the second generation 1960-61 to 61 models. 
Virgil Exner, who was Chrysler's chief stylist from 1955 until 61, favored big fins, tons of chrome, large bumpers, two-tone colors, and other typical styling motifs from the mid-50s. By the end of the decade, these designs were falling out of favor with new car buyers that wanted something less garish and more contemporary looking. For me, I still like Exner's designs, especially in this model series prior to the third gen models from 62 to 64. But when looking at any of the third gen offerings, it's immediately obvious they're so refreshingly different, clean, well proportioned, and modern looking. Of all these models available, Fury, Belvedere, and Savoy, I really dig the Fury, especially the Sport Fury with its front bucket seats and console. Just look how Plymouth offered so many options and color choices both inside and out to ensure that every car could be personalized for each customer. The third gen cars sold much better than their predecessors. They were handsome cars from the base model Savoy up to the Sport Fury convertible. So what's my dream 64 Plymouth Fury? Well it's got to be the hardtop because I love the tapered C pillars that flow gracefully into the tops of the quarter panels. And the grille is a work of art. It's simple yet elegant. It's going to have to be a Sport Fury because those big front bucket seats look comfortable and the console looks right at home between them. Under the hood, let's put the 426 Commando V8. This one's a wedge design, not a Hemi. That's two years later. Number 15, 1963 Corvette Coupe. By 1962, the Corvette had become a living legend. The first gen car is now commonly referred to as C1s were due for an update. Chevrolet management was planning on a totally new car for 63, but what came next completely elated the Corvette faithful. The cars took on a completely new shape and there were still two body styles available, a sport coupe and a traditional convertible. A removable hardtop was optional, giving an owner the best of both worlds. These new vets got a new macho sounding name, Stingray. They now also featured hidden headlamps, a first for American cars since the 42 DeSoto, along with doors that extended into the roof and those oh so stylish fake hood scoops. Interiors were all new too. What really made these cars better than the previous year's offerings was the new chassis. This year, all the V8s available displaced 327 cubic inches. There were four different versions of this second year power plant. First was the standard 250 horse four barrel, then the 300 horse four barrel with a bigger carb and camshaft, then was the 340 horsepower Duntoff designed solid lifter cam engine, and finally the 360 horsepower Rochester fuel injected small block. Zora Arcus Duntoff was an ingenious mechanical engineer who had been in the industry since the early 40s. Among many performance parts, he's also credited with designing various engine components, particularly for the small block Chevrolet engine starting in the mid 50s. He was very influential in many various parts of the new Stingray. He conceived a new design of camshafts especially for these engines and they became known as a Duntoff cam. Sometimes it's as if the car god smiled on certain vehicles and everything just fell together to create the perfect car. A car that even today still stirs the emotions of enthusiasts and collectors. The 63 Corvette is such a car. Any color combo, drivetrain, or option package matters little when it's all wrapped around a car as awesome as the 63 Corvette Sport Coupe. It's pure perfection. Number 14, 1960 DeSoto Adventurer. A new model would be introduced at Chrysler in 1960 to compete in the burgeoning new compact car market. It was called Valiant. It would be its own make for a brief time until the decision was made to roll DeSoto into the Plymouth division in June of 59. Later, the decision was made to eliminate DeSoto and add Valiant to the Plymouth line. Because suppliers had produced most of the unique components for the 1961 DeSotos by this time, it was decided that the cars would be built until the parts supplies were exhausted. Production was halted immediately after only building 3,040 cars. Consider this. The DeSoto was a completely restyled car from front to back compared to the previous year. In 1960, 
it would also be a first unibody design. The first for Chrysler since the airflow models of the 1930s. Despite all the changes and challenges for DeSoto in 1960, they still managed to sell 26,081 cars in two series, the Fireflight and the Adventurer. While I wouldn't mind owning either a 60 or 61 model, it'd have to be a two-door hardtop. Overall, I prefer the styling of the 60 for several reasons. One thing's for sure, though, whichever you prefer, nothing made before or since looks like it, making owning either one of them a truly exclusive experience. Tell us in the comments if you agree with me or not. Number 13, 1964 Ford Fairlane. For the ninth time in its history, Motor Trend Magazine selected a car manufacturer's entire lineup of cars to win their prestigious Car of the Year award. When examining the lineup that Ford made available at their franchise dealers nationwide in the 1964 model year, they were all really great cars in styling, available options, color and interior trim choices, quality, and everything else buyers were looking for. Let's look at the Compact Falcon, which this year received a complete restyling to look more modern than its predecessors. Our next up the scale was the Fairlane. Now in its third year of being its own midsize series, they were available in eight different models. I've had three different 64 Fairlanes, and they're perfectly proportioned in styling and in size to be fun to drive and easy to maneuver. A Ford's full-size entry was simply called Ford and included five distinct series. These cars were very popular with the public. And finally, Ford had the Thunderbird for the buyers seeking the ultimate in luxury and prestige. Now in its fourth generation, these cars looked completely new as compared to their 63 counterparts. They were available in three different body styles. In addition, Ford's truck line was selling well, so 1964 would have been a great year to have a Ford dealership franchise. Which one of them is my favorite? Well, I had a 64 Fairlane Sports Coupe with the 289 Hypo engine, and I've also had a beautiful Galaxy 500XL hardtop, so it's a toss-up. But if I had to choose one, I'd go with the Fairlane. It was a nice driving car that was a lot of fun with 271 horses under the hood. Number 12, 1961 Chevrolet Impala. By 1961, the Chevrolet Impala series was one of General Motors' best-selling vehicles. Blessed with a beautifully styled sheet metal and perfectly proportioned trim from every angle, these cars looked more expensive than they really were. The new Impalas in 1958 were completely revised from their 1957 counterparts. And it turns out 58 would be a one-year body style. In 1959, the Impala had a dramatically styled roofline that came to be known as the bubble top by enthusiasts. Other GM divisions also used a similar design. It's my opinion that the best looking model was, of course, the convertible. But an argument could be made for the Sport Coupe. I really like these cars from all angles. And while they have many similar styling cues to the previous year, I like the overall design just a bit better. But don't get me wrong, if somebody were to give me a 60 instead, I'd be quite content to cruise around with a top down and accept the sincere accolades of mere mortals who could only hope to even ride in one of these beauties. Number 11, 1960 Chrysler 300F. For 1960, Chrysler increased the horsepower on these cars by reworking the 413 cubic inch V8, first introduced the year before. Freshly re-engineered, the 413 was now putting out an impressive 375 horsepower. Except for the Imperial models, 1960 was the first year that Chrysler offered all of their full-sized cars as unibodies. This made them significantly lighter than their full-framed predecessors. Also, this year, every grille for the Chrysler branded cars would all appear to be the same to assist people in immediately identifying their corporate connection. Their design was simple yet elegant. My favorite styling cue was the faux trunk-mounted spare tire, complete with a hubcap. This would be the first and last time this feature would be seen on a letter series Chrysler. But nearly as cool were the special red, white, and blue 300F plastic ornaments adorning 10 different spots on the exteriors and interiors of these special automobiles. Inside is where the 300F really shines. 
The seats in the front are individual buckets that manually swivel out to assist in entry and exit. A stately console is placed between them and extends to the rear seating area, where bucket-like seats are found as well. The dash is incredible and features the Astrodome instrument cluster while the automatic equipped cars retain the push-button controls on the left side of the cluster. All other Chrysler branded cars got it as well. Everything seemed perfect, even though it now seems a bit much. Remember though, this was the style of the day, especially for high-end luxury motor cars. To my eyes, the entire body styling cues along with the chrome and ornamentation seem to be the most pure on the 1960 models. Although I love how a convertible looks with the top down, I'd select a hard top in tango red with a standard tan colored leather interior. I'd order white wall tires to showcase those exquisite wheel covers. Finally, every option available would undoubtedly appeal to me. Hey, why not order a 300F with everything? Number 10, 1963-64 Studebaker Avanti. Before making this list, I knew the Avanti would definitely be on it. Its styling is still so fresh, it'd look right at home in any new car showroom even today. The history of this car and its parent company is fascinating. Here's a synopsis of how this car came to be. The not yet named Avanti began development under the direction of the newest Studebaker president, Sherwood Egbert. The car's overall design theme was Egbert's vision as a final attempt at improving Studebaker's dismal sales performance. He hired industrial designer Raymond Lowy, and Lowy assembled a team, and they began working in total isolation at nearly a round-the-clock schedule. The team was able to deliver Egbert the finalized design drawings just 40 days later. After receiving Egbert's blessing to continue, Within eight days, the stylists finished a clay scale model with two different sides, one as a two-seater sports car and the other as a four-seat sports car. With input from the entire team, compromises were made, yet the vision of the car was pure. Meanwhile, Studebaker's advertising agency would begin preparing a campaign for these sporty cars, and it was they who provided the name Avanti. In Italian, it means forward or onward. The Avanti's complex body lines would have been nearly impossible to produce in steel, so the decision was made to use fiberglass. There were not many choices when it came to vendors that had the facilities to build a fiberglass body, or the know-how and the production capabilities. They went with Molded Fiberglass Body Company. They were the same company that built all the fiberglass panels for the Chevrolet Corvette starting in 1953. The first Avanti bodies made by this enterprise were not of a good enough quality, so cars couldn't immediately go into production. Delays with working with their engineers, material shortages, transporting bodies back to Studebaker's Indiana assembly plant, and other obstacles only allowed a fraction of the bodies needed to actually go into production. The goal was to supply each dealer with an Avanti for the model's launch, as well as keeping up with the demand from buyers. Big interest was created by the motoring press, but only a few bodies that met quality standards were actually built, and no one seemed to know how to fix the problem. So once the bodies got back to Indiana, they were placed atop a modified Studebaker Lark 109-inch wheelbase convertible chassis. All were powered by a new R1289 Hawk engine. A Paxton supercharger was also offered as an option, as was a 4-speed transmission, pause traction rear axle, and many other options. The Avanti was publicly introduced in April of 62. Studebaker President Egbert was optimistic enough to predict that 20,000 Avantis would be sold that first year. Because of many of the production problems, they could only build 1,200 for 1963 and another 3,447 cars in 1964. Nonetheless, the cars that were built and sold were well received. Called the fastest production car in the world upon its introduction, a modified Avanti reached over 170 miles per hour at the Bonneville Salt Flats. In all, it broke 29 world speed records. Despite all this, the car could not save the company, and less than one calendar year and two model years, Studebaker shut the program down. The Avanti name, tooling, and plant space were then sold to two partners. 
Renaming it the Avanti 2, it was reintroduced as a slightly modified hand-built version of the original using leftover chassis and now sourcing engines from General Motors. There was no connection with the Studebaker brand name. Studebaker seriously considered reintroducing the Avani into Studebaker showrooms for 1965, but they never did. A succession of additional entrepreneurs purchased the tooling and name again to continue manufacturing small numbers of Avantis. Even a four-door model was made for a brief time. 2006 would be the car's last production year. So what do you think of the Avani? Let us know in the comments. Number 9. 1960 Edsel Convertible the final year Edsel may have been the most handsome, at least in many people's opinion. The Edsel first debuted as its own division of Ford Motor Company in 1958. It was intended to be a car priced between a Ford and a Mercury. Slower than expected sales for 1958 ended up with a very disappointing number of cars sold. The next year, sales kept declining. By 1960, the decision had been made to discontinue the Edsel line. And so, very unceremoniously, Ford President Robert McNamara shut down the entire program just a little over a month into the 1960 model production. My dream Edsel is the 1960 Ranger Convertible. A mere 76 of these beautifully styled drop tops ever saw the light of day at the Louisville, Kentucky plant. Since these cars were built, a huge amount of collector interest has surrounded them. Well restored convertibles can easily fetch over $100,000. Because these cars were heavily based on the Ford offerings of the same year, many clones exist. If you're in the market for one, be cautious, but an educated buyer can avoid getting burned if they know the most important telltale sign between the two. The difference is that the wheelbase on a full-size Ford was 119 inches. The Edsels were all built on a 120 inch wheelbase. So bring your measuring tape along. I think the 60 Edsel convertible in red is the perfect choice. What do you think? Number 8. 1963 Pontiac Grand Prix Pontiac had traditionally offered cars priced smack dab between Chevrolet as the entry level and Oldsmobile as a mid-priced offering in the hierarchy of General Motors. Next to Chevrolet, Pontiac was the best-selling car line for GM. Although the mid-sized purpose-built GTO was just a year away, Pontiac was building some pretty awesome full-size cars. It took a lot of personal debate on which of the first five years of the 60s of Pontiac production I like best. My favorites are the full-size cars, although the other models have their pluses too. I finally settled on the 63 model, but specifically the Grand Prix. It has such a dramatic roof line, and unlike the other models Pontiac offered that year, it had no side trim except for rocker panel and wheel lip moldings, whereas the Bonneville and Catalina both had distinct side trim for each model. The trunk panel trim was very similar to the Bonneville, except for the obvious nomenclature differences. The dashboards in 63 are absolutely breathtaking, and the choices of seating and materials could yield untold amounts of possibilities. Well, since I've optioned many of my selections, I'd want this beautiful 63 Pontiac to be painted silver leaf green with a black interior. I'd also order the 389 tri-power engine rated at 370 horses. Of course, there's a four-speed under that sexy hard top body, which also makes the dash mount a tachometer standard. I'd also order these beautiful eight lug wheels with white wall tires. Then I'd be in it every day, being the envy of every car guy and girl that sees it. Man, what a car and a perfect set of equipment, all from the factory. Number 7, 1964 Cadillac. This was a tough choice. I think all of the early 60s caddies are beautifully styled. Comparing it to a Lincoln Continental or an Imperial from Chrysler immediately made it obvious that each motor car is distinctly different. By 1964, the rear tail fins had all but disappeared. The car's heavily sculpted sides now had what I thought was a simpler, more pleasing design. My favorite part of the 64 is that classic grille, updated from previous years to include a center strip. With a choice of 11 distinct body styles and 21 exterior colors, a buyer could customize his car exactly as he wanted. Lots of new mechanical improvements from the year before made it a bit easier choice for me. 
Several firsts, like the incredibly advanced, fully automated interior climate control system, was optional. A totally new power plant design displacing 429 cubic inches instead of the previous 390, and the first hydromatic three-speed automatic transmission. There were other less noticeable improvements to the suspension, brakes, and steering, but they made a big difference, especially to loyal Cadillac owners or even those brand loyal to other makes who were considering a change. Just look at the lines on these incredible cars. Cadillac was known as the standard of the world at the time, and the word Cadillac has evolved to mean the best of the best. The next year's offerings would prove to be radically changed, but I prefer the more vintage appearance of the early 60s caddies. Which one do you like, and what body style is your favorite? Okay, number 6. 1961-63 to 63 Ford Unicab Pickup Truck When Ford debuted the new F100 and other light truck models in 1953, a new era was rolled out where buyers were expecting a truck to work hard all week and then take its owners to the country club on Saturday night, where its eye-catching new styling would look right at home amongst the other cars of the day. Ford was ready to release a totally and newly redesigned pickup truck for the 1961 model year. As expected, the trucks were available in the F100, F250, and F350 models depending on the payload requirements. Several body styles could be had with various cab and bed configurations, but the big news for the body styles in 61 would be the addition of the Unicab pickup truck, available as a short box and a long box. The cabs remained the same, and the fleet side style was the only choice buyers had. Aside from some minor trim differences, Ford made these trucks available from 61 until 63. So for three short years, these pickups were among the most unique models available within the domestic truck market. They were never really a runaway sales success, and all these years later, due to unique styling, low production numbers, and normal attrition, the remaining examples, particularly the short box models, are extremely desirable for restorers and hot rodders alike. Although this fourth generation of Ford's immensely successful F-Series continued on without the Unicab until 1966, this unusual body style is still regarded by many as one of the most gracefully styled offerings. What Unicab do you like and why? Any special memories of one of these beauties from your past? Please let us know in the comments. Number 5. The Chevrolet 409 engine. Impala, Bel Air, and Biscayne models. Alright, I'm probably going to get a ton of comments about this selection. For me, the full-size Chevrolet lineup in the early 60s is the most pleasing design of the full-size lineup throughout the rest of the decade. Undoubtedly, every year and model has their fans, and rightly so. Because something can be said for each as to why so many people prefer one over the other just a little bit more. Now, compared to earlier years, fins were now all gone, and clean styling was the new order of the day. Use of chrome to highlight certain features was now more purposeful. For 1962, the hardtop models had two different tops available. The traditional sport coupe, which was actually a bubble top and now only available in the Bel Air series, and the new sport coupe hardtop design found exclusively on the Impala. In 1963, all hardtops would only use the new top and the cars were completely restyled. But beyond the styling is that marvelous engine that had been in development for a few years, the legendary 409. Its humble beginnings go back to 1958 when a new truck engine displacing 348 cubes was being developed. Because of the shape of the valve covers, they were colloquially called a W motor. Some soon found their way into the car lineup that year. In 1961, the 409 was born. That first year, very few big Chevys got that engine. Now it became more readily available in 62 and then ended abruptly midway through 65. There were several different horsepower configurations offered during this all too brief time period. The 427, or Z11 as the option package is known, was available in 1963 for drag racing only. These engines are iconic because of their performance and tunability. When new, a popular Beach Boys song was recorded about it, adding to the legend. 
That's why when anybody says 409 even today, everyone knows what it is, car person or not. That's legendary, my friends. Because this impressive mill could be ordered in all three series, any buyer could order exactly the car that could scratch that insatiable performance car itch. For me, I want the 62 Biscayne two-door sedan and tuxedo black with a black interior. Of course, the 409 horse engine and a close ratio four-speed, along with a positive traction rear axle with 411 gears. A tachometer, and not much else. I don't need any power accessories, a radio, or creature comforts. I might get the outside rearview mirrors so I could get a look at the guy I just beat in an impromptu street race. Rolling stock would be black wall tires on painted steel wheels with the poverty caps. Now this would be the ultimate sleeper. People usually expect to see a 409 in a super sport. That's not nearly stealthy enough for me. Number 4. 1961-64 Jaguar XKE The E-Type was introduced in 1961 as a rear-wheel drive grand touring sports car, either as a coupe, or as the Brits designated, a fixed-head coupe, or as a two-seater convertible, or what is commonly called an open two-seater in Europe. The classic design was inspired by Jaguar's founder Sir William Lyons, and penned by aerodynamic engineer Malcolm Sayer. Even Enzo Ferrari himself stated that he thought this was the most beautiful car ever designed. It heavily influenced the look of the Datsun 240Z, styled by legendary Japanese designer Yoshihiko Matsuo. This classic even inspired American manufacturers to create the pony car concept, a long hood with a short deck. Since later model updates of the E-Type were officially designated Series 2 and Series 3, over time the earliest cars built have come to be referred to as Series 1 among enthusiasts. It's my opinion that the earliest Series 1 models are just a bit more stylish. Number 3, 1961-64 to Lincoln Continental. Lincoln had been a division of Ford since the company's founder purchased controlling interest in Lincoln in 1922 from Henry Leyland. Yeah, the same man who started the Cadillac division in 1903 before selling it to General Motors in 1909. Leyland then started the Lincoln Motor Company in 1917 where he began supplying the V-12 Liberty engines for aircraft for World War I duty. Mr. Leland was a very busy man and quite wealthy once everything had been sold off. Very interesting, don't you think? Elwood Engel was part of Ford's styling team that designed many of the automobiles Ford and its divisions were selling in the late 50s and early 60s, like the four-seater Thunderbirds, the Marks III, IV, and V, and more. You can see most similarities between these cars and the 61 to 63 Thunderbirds. Engel had an eye for design and Ford President Robert McNamara wanted an all-new car that could solidly compete with Cadillac. Prior to this, McNamara was seriously considering killing the Lincoln division along with Edsel in 1960, but when he saw the initial drawings, he opted to go ahead with it. The Continental was available as a sedan and a convertible when they debuted in 1961. Both had four doors with the fronts opening conventionally and the rears opening in the opposite direction. This style of door is known as a suicide door. These cars were so different and innovative in both design and function, they became an immediate sales success. But they could never best Cadillac sales in any of the early years simply because Cadillac had several other body styles as well as having a large and loyal customer base. These Continentals were actually unibody cars, a first for Lincoln. Offered in many stylish and classic colors both inside and out, every buyer was sure to find the perfect color combination. The solidly reliable 430 cubic inch engine, a staple in the Ford lineup since 1958, powered these beauties. But surprisingly, all were two barrel carburetors until 63, when a Carter built four barrel was used. Since many options could be ordered, it was hard to find two cars equipped exactly alike. Our favorite of all four years is the 63 model, because it holds much sentimentality for Dana, because of the one her family had while she was growing up. It was painted a striking dark red color called Spanish Red, 
and had a black and white leather interior. Beautifully elegant describes them perfectly. Number 2. 1964 Pontiac GTO. In sheer reverence and respect for the great one, this car had to be on the list. It seems every car nut has an early GTO story to tell. For me, as I approached legal driving age in 1979, a car guy down the street from my family home had a 64 GTO. I learned to drive a manual transmission with this car, and it was the first one I tinkered on with my slightly older neighbor to discover how much fun vintage cars really are. In 1964, GM had an internal policy that clearly stated that no car could be built with less than 10 pounds of total vehicle weight per cubic inch displacement of the engine, which is why the Pontiac 389 cubic inch V8 had only been used in full-sized cars up to that point. John DeLorean and his team needed to find a loophole if the GTO was ever going to hit the streets. When they came up with the concept of the GTO option for the Pontiac Le Mans, they found their loophole. They started a movement and were all better because of it. In 11 model years and countless special and limited editions, the GTO was and remains today one of the most popular and collectible muscle cars of all time. And it all started with a team that thumbed their noses at GM's upper management and defiantly created a legend. We owe them all our respect. And thank you, gentlemen. One of the men behind the GTO concept was Jim Wangers. Jim passed away recently and will likely never see a promotions man like Jim again. He was clever and creative and knew what car guys wanted because he was one of us. We had the distinct honor to meet him in 2022. We'll never forget him. Rest in peace, Mr. Wangers. Number 1. 1964 Shelby Cobra 260 or 289 What can be said about this legendary hybrid American sports car that hasn't been said before? It's a legend and was destined to be that even when new. The inspirational story of how a retired race car driver turned out race cars for others to run is one that most everyone has heard. A movie was even made about it not too long ago. I won't go into all the details about Old Shell, as he was called, but suffice it to say that without his vision to build an American sports car that could compete and win against the Corvette and other well-engineered foreign-made racers, this whole story would never have come to life. It was truly an uphill battle for Carroll because the vet had the full support and resources of General Motors behind it, and Shelby's project had essentially no funding or engineering to speak of. The first 75 Cobras, known as Mark 1s, were fitted with the upgraded 260 cubic inch V8, while the remaining 51 Mark 1 models were fitted with a larger version of the Windsor-built Ford engine, the 289 cubic inch V8. In late 62, Alan Turner, AC's chief engineer, completed a major redesign of the car's front end to accommodate rack and pinion steering while still using the reliable transverse leaf spring suspension. These updated cars, now dubbed Mark II, entered production in early 63. About 528 Mark II Cobras were produced from 1963 till the summer of 65, when an even bigger legend hit the pavement. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, even people who aren't Ford fans. I'll take a Mark II in British Racing Green, of course. Well, that's our list. Remember, I said it was in no particular order. We spent a lot of time talking to other car people about their favorites and then assembling this list. At first, we had 31 cars on it. It was tough to whittle it down to 20. It was a ton of fun doing this list and researching each one. Sometimes, different sources provide slightly different information, so a few things discussed here could be argued as wrong. But really... It's all about these magnificent vehicles and what they mean to all of us. Please let us know in the comments what choices you agree with or you don't agree with, and which ones did we miss. Let me again say the list is in no particular order, so please don't get upset that your favorite car wasn't number one or that you thought different cars should be in different positions. These are just our opinions and everyone will have a different take on a list like this. This is supposed to be fun. We hope you enjoyed this video and maybe you even learned something. I know I did. Thanks for watching and spending some time with us today. We appreciate it. See you soon.